This is the Women Your Mother Warned You About podcast, sponsored by Sales Gravy. I'm Gina Tremarco, Master Sales Trainer and Director of Coaching Programs at Sales Gravy. Before we get started with this week's episode, I want you to go and check out Sales Gravy University. Sales Gravy University is the place where sales professionals and sales leaders from across the globe go to learn and upscale. And right now, if you're a brand new user and you've never used Sales Gravy University before, you can get your first course for free by using coupon code free course when you go to learn.salesgravy.com. That's coupon code free course when you go to learn.salesgravy.com. And hey, I've got several courses there that you can check out. So I hope to see you there. But let's go ahead and get started with this week's episode. Welcome to another episode of the Women Your Mother Warned You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy. This is Gina Tremarco. And I am Master. Oh, oh, hey, oh, I'm, oh. Now I'm a Master Sales Trainer <laughs> at Sales Gravy. Now you can go. And I am Susanna Gray Jones. <laughs> watch, watch yourself, Susanna Gray Jones. Oh, I am watching. Susanna Gray Jones. She's still standing. She's still standing. Mm, she's still here. And this is another episode that goes rogue no guest on the show this week and hey you know what i got some feedback over the weekend well, here we go <laughs> we love we love our guests but i got some feedback from some listeners who are like we love your guests but we want more gina we want more of gina and Susanna. okay maybe they said that we want regina <laughs> but um they said they're you're so great at like spotlighting the guests but we want to hear more about what you think so i i like that when we do episodes that are just you and me so we have fun just don't re- we we have fun we have fun. we do and for our listeners for a special listener out there named stacy um this one's for you so we will be bringing you more of the gina and Susanna content uh, although outbound's coming up and we we are highlighting a lot of our outbound um, guests and speakers. So uh, we will have a lot of episodes coming up with with amazing expertise from those thought leaders. So today, so excited. just us. So just us. excited. So what do you want to talk about today? So I thought it would be really interesting because I've been reading lots of sales books yeah. and As we were saying earlier, everyone's talking about discovery, right? Everyone's got their opinion on what good discovery looks like. Yeah. I have been asking listeners, people in sales who are being coached, what kind of questions they would like to ask you and myself about discovery calls. So, oh, I love this. This is my favorite. Yeah. So I'm feeling like listeners, questions, discovery. What do you think? I I love that idea. I love discovery i've seen your discovery calls <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if that's that good or bad the way you said that. no it's good you lure them in in such a <laughs> such a fantastic way that i've started copying and it works it good works. happy away happy away yeah it does and um so the kind of questions that we've got are general kind of listener problems where they feel something's not quite connecting. So, and we encourage, right, anyone who wants to ask us questions just to message us on LinkedIn um, or just send us an email because there are a lot of people out there selling daily and not quite understanding how or what, and we, we want to help. So the first question was, everyone talks about listening in discovery calls. And you know, like when you're about, I don't know, 20 and you go to your first sales training and they go, good listening. What does good listening look like? And everyone's like, oh, stop patronizing me. I know what good listening is. Mm. But actually, what is active listening? Because sometimes I feel that when I'm in discovery, it's just a one-way conversation. Like I'm just throwing questions at them, but how can I show that I'm really actively listening? Mm, that's a good question. You want me to take that first? Yes. I want to okay. hear what you've got to say. So this is a this is a sweet spot for me, especially coming from the improv world, because everything we do in that, based on the concept of yes and, the foundation is the listen, right? So we talk about the yes and concept of listening, active listening with your ears and your eyes, and then 
uh, validating them by repeating what you heard them say, and then collaborating by adding your two cents or diverting it, you know, heightening it, building it bigger. But it starts with the active listen. So for me, the active listening means not just listening to the words that they say. And so there are a couple of different components here. Are we on the phone? Are we on a video call? Are we face to face? In all of those arenas, we could be active listening with our ears and our eyes. So if I'm on a call and all I can rely on are my ears, I am listening to verbal and nonverbal, meaning I'm also listening to the silence. I'm listening to the cadence of speech. I'm listening to what's in the background. I'm listening to um, like the size that they make, right? Like the breathe, like the breathing part of it. In video, I think people, you know, they say it's harder now with video, and I say BS. I've actually taught courses in this on how to be better um, from. A, reading cues visually, you can watch the people on screen and still be watching their nonverbal, but Mm. you can see everything going on with them and their face and their background. And you can really read that on video, paying attention to that. And then face-to-face, same thing. So for me, active listening is about intentionality, Mm. right? So you have to be intentional walking into it that I'm going to pay attention to everything. And for me, active listening also goes hand in hand with note taking. Mm. I I am listening with my, I guess, with my hand too. Like I'm writing <laughs> everything down. Um, I'm always like amused at myself because I usually update my CRM later with my discovery notes. Like I spent all weekend doing discovery note updates in my CRM. Mm. And I go back and I read these notes and I was like, gosh, thank goodness. I wrote those things down because I had already forgotten them. Yeah, yeah. So because I like am writing the entire time, I'm listening that way so Mm. that I get it right. And then that always pays off for me when I do proposals, because when I do a proposal, I actually put it in their exact words, what their pains are, what their desires are. It's in their exact words. And sometimes I'll even put it in quotes. And I'm like, well, you said this quote, Mm. end quote, right? That's what active listening is to me. I know there's a long answer to the question, but what is it to you? Ooh, it's coming back to me. So I am at the gym every day and my recent Audible book, and you're going to tell me off if I get his name wrong again, because he is a massive hero in the world of sales. (laughs) Here (laughs) we go. Uh, Uh, It's such a big fan of his. I should get his name right. Um, Anthony Ian Marino. Um, I'm reading. <laughs> did I get it right? <laughs> I can't wait till he's on the show. I'm going to let you introduce him. I Anthony, love Anthony in Reno. Yeah, that's what I said, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, he's um he was talking about how you leave three seconds after they speak and it just lets them add anything that they, they want to add because we're all so quick yeah. to jump in with what we think. And how many people on these Zoom calls, and don't lie, Gina, I bet you're doing it now, have a little little glance at ourselves. Oh, how do I look today? <laughs> Whilst the other person's speaking, we all do it. No. And I'm getting better at it, I must say. No, I'm not. You're not. No, I'm not looking at myself. Well, you're awesome. I, I mean, I, I'm not looking at myself as much as I used to because I'm a trained coach and trainer for sales baby <laughs> but it it is it's hard is that a thing for, is that a thing for no I mean because we're trainers and we've mm. been trained in virtual selling I think maybe maybe I just maybe it's easy for me to say I don't look at myself because I've been trained to not look at myself I think there is that I mean I was doing a discovery call the other day and they said to me oh you're so good at looking at the camera and I was like oh someone noticed I've been doing this for so long intentionally that it's just natural now Um, but you can and don't you think you can tell people think that when they're looking at themselves that you can't tell but you you can tell when people's eyes go down or they look to the side oh yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. you're you're checking yourself out but that does make listening in discovery calls a lot harder for many people so I think I think there's that but I think one thing is to experience it right so we all know how it feels when someone's not listening and we want to get our point of view across. And especially when you're on the phone and you can hear them typing, that feeling in your gut of like, 
how dare you? That rejection. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. awful. And it's the number one reason that people are failing in their discovery calls, in my opinion. Well, chiming in on that, like people ask about how to be better active listeners. I, I definitely, from what I've been told, possibly have ADD. So I am easily distracted. So because I'm, I know that I'm easily distracted, I have to be very intentional, which means have nothing else around me that could distract me. Mm. Um, I just got a new phone because I broke my phone and I went over to the dark side and got an iPhone, mm -hmm. a personal phone. I've got a work phone that's an iPhone. Um, and I just figured out how to turn off all the notifications on it because those notifications will like totally take me in another direction. Um, right. So I have to limit anything that could take me off track so that I stay focused. I have to shut everything else off. Um, I have a notepad next to me mm -hmm. so that I can stay on track mm. in the call in paying attention. Attention control. In, yeah, it's intention to have attention. Yes. And how lovely sometimes when you do put your phone, gosh, I said so posh then, didn't I? How lovely. How, how lovely. lovely. How lovely. <laughs> when, so when you don't have so your phone. Lush. <laughs> when you don't have your phone and you spend some quality time having a conversation with someone. And I said to my husband the other day, one of the reasons I love Discovery Calls and I love the podcast is because I'm not doing my recruiting. I'm not waiting for someone to call me or to text me or, you know, it's which you always have. Um, so yeah, that's a big, big thing for me. I just lost the video of you speaking of watching <laughs> <I know>. you. <laughs> Did you do that on purpose? No, I didn't. I don't know what happened. It's not uh, well, it's funny because to go back to what you were, um, for those listening, we are on Zoom and look at each other. Um, and her video just went out. But, um, one of the things that I do, and this is something we teach in virtual selling called reframing, I will tell them on a call, mm -hmm. hey, um, if if my eyes go away from you, because right now I'm looking at my, my camera lens so that you can feel my eye contact. Uh, but every now and then I'm going to actually take my eyes off the lens so that I can see your face um, just to see if like you have any questions or comments. I'm going to just check in with you that way. And I let them know that my my eyes are going to wander. And so that's a really good way to let them know because what they don't realize because of the way we're wired, the subconscious is like kicking in with safety bias going, what's wrong with this picture? What's going on? Why is yeah. she, what is she looking at? Who's she looking at? She's not paying attention to me. But if you pre-frame it and say, my eyes might leave the lens to check in on you, then when your eyes do leave the lens, that might actually make them feel like, oh, she's looking at me. Yeah. So it's kind of a reverse way of making them like, just tell them. Yeah. Yeah. And we never do that. And that's a, that's no. a thing. Like it's easy. We, it's easy to preframe. And it's such a big thing that can happen that can essentially really change the way that somebody sees you in one of these mm -hmm. calls. So yeah. it, it, it's a massive one. And I do think that we talk about active listening a lot and people think they do it, but they don't realize they don't. Mm. So I think there's a massive point there about assuming that you listen. Well, it's a, yeah, everybody assumes that they're good listeners. And then whenever I teach that yes and exercise, mm -hmm. the feedback always is, oh my gosh, I'm not a good listener. I did. Yeah. I had no idea just from doing that exercise because in that exercise, uh, you have to listen to be able to repeat them word for word. Yeah, 100%. You can't 100%. paraphrase it. You have to repeat it in their words, which means you have to listen. So when they do that exercise, which by the way, you can, our listeners can get that exercise by downloading my book, a play ebook at Sales Gravy. So in the Sales Gravy resources, so just go to salesgravy.com. That's free, then, right? It's a free one. Yeah, you could just go to our free resources and download the play, explains how to do the yes and exercise. But I always get, People always go, oh my gosh, I had no idea I was a bad listener. Yeah. And do you think it is down to attention control? I think it's, yeah, I think it's attention control. I think it's an intention to have attention control. And I, I think it's because we're so worried about how we come off and how we look mm. that we're actually listening to the voices in our head. Yes. Versus the voices speaking to us. 
I think it's something that people do in general social situations as well yeah. as discovery. Um, oh, there was a great thing I was watching on TV the other day because I'm into my music. They were talking about music improvisation, so jazz, and they oh, were going yes. back through, you know, the whole different cultures and what it means to improvise in jazz and why people yeah. like listening to it. And one of the things they said was, someone said, I can't improvise. I, I'm a good musician, but I can't improvise. And they said, well, you're doing it every day in conversation. Yes. And they thought about it and they're like, oh, yeah, I am. So mm -hmm. it's like you say, as children, we're taught to yeah. improvise, but then yeah. we grow out of it. And actually, we actually we're actually not taught. You we're actually think? born. No, we're actually born with it. Yeah. And then we unlearn it. Yeah. So we unlearn it. So you're wired for it. So if you look at the studies on creativity, 98% of us were um, creative geniuses at age five, 98% based mm -hmm. on the studies. We actually unlearn it over time. Mm -hmm. So if you watch babies and you watch children and how, especially children, think about your own littles, right? Mm -hmm. They're make-believe and they're, they're invisible friends and the different crazy things they come up with in their storytelling. They are constantly improvising mm -hmm. until we, until we beat it out of them. We do. We do. And I think, yeah, just look at how quickly they learn English and we mm -hmm. take so long to learn French, right? Yeah. Um, because we're actually thinking about learning a new language, whereas with them, it's just they are absorbing everything and just using it. Go straight. It's like we almost get lost in our brains, don't we? It's, yeah. Um, yeah. You know more about this than me, but I find it fascinating. Yeah. Active listening. I mean, we could talk about that forever, couldn't we? Because I, I genuinely think that it's something that you've got to work at to improve because like you say, you unlearn it, you've got to get back into it and it, it requires uh, attention. Practice. Well. It, it's, it requires practice. You can, you can practice it and, and bring it back. And I, I always relate it back to having owned an improv comedy theater and managing an audience and leading an audience. And you really get there. You keep them engaged when you can call things back throughout the show, mm. right? If I, if I took five minutes at the beginning of a show to get to know the audience and I get to know a little bit about several people in the audience and then I sprinkle that in through the show, mm -hmm. right? And I bring it back maybe half an hour into like, oh yeah, that that English girl from the UK is here, <laughs> right? Right, and I might, I might, I might call back something about you, mm -hmm. right? And it's one little thing. And it was the only thing that you told me about yourself. But the point is, is that I remembered you and I called it back. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, she, she's the best listener in the world. Yeah. Because yeah. I remembered one thing. Yeah, exactly. And I think we go into autopilot as well. Like think back to, uh, I love Keith gives a great example of this from Sales Gravy. When you are in your car and you go to the same place that you've been every day and you don't think about it. So we all get used to supposedly listening, but maybe not listening. But the, I once had a really bad experience. I lost my grandma in the middle of some training yeah. and I had to carry on training. I didn't have a choice. I just had to carry on training. Yeah. And that was one of the best training courses I've ever delivered because I was so engaged in, in listening to, to my, to my team that I was training because I had to adjust my natural pattern of just going on my own sort of, you know, uh, route. But I actually listened in a way that I never had. I was in my early twenties and I really learned from that. I thought you have to learn to focus. You can't just go on like you normally would. You have to actually exercise that muscle, um, that you've got to find. So yeah, it's really interesting. Are you ready for my next question? <laughs> it is it's similar. Um, she said, my client complains that I never get to the point because we go through such deep discovery that they feel that this discovery goes around in circles and they want to get to the proposal more quickly. So client says, can we please just get to the proposal? We're going through the motions and I just want to know how much this is going to cost. Well, let's let's back up for a second. So there's discovery and there's presentation, right? There's the sales yeah. presentation. So let's be a little more specific here because me personally, if I'm on a discovery call, I'm not doing, I'm not presenting a proposal yeah. until another the next call, right? So I do a discovery, then I schedule a call. Um, 
Now, in some cases, you know this, like when it comes to coaching, that's a different kind of sale. It's a little more B2C, I like to say, because because I'm selling to one person that's usually paying out of their pocket. And so I will do a discovery. Then I will ask them for permission to tell them about our program. I mean, I want to be specific about that. I ask for permission. Then I tell them about the program. Then um, I ask them what they think about the program Mm -hmm. and if it's for them. And then I get around to the price. Yeah. So to be specific with this person, at what point do you know, are they in a situation where that person is asking for a price? Is it really in the discovery session or do they do discovery and presentation in one call? Yeah. And I think um, the point of the person who was asking the question, they felt rushed past the discovery. So regardless of whether it was in the in the one call, I think they felt that the client was trying to rush them to get to the price. This is really common, right? Sometimes yeah. you get procurement who call up people and they say, just let me know the price. Just let me know the price. Please, please. I haven't got time. Um, can we just get to the point? And I, I get asked this a lot by people in coaching and get asked it all the time when I'm doing training. And I always say, put it back onto the client and, you know, say, I would love to get to the point and give you a price, but it might be the incorrect price unless we go through this process. And I'm here to solve a problem for you. I might not yeah. get the right problem. And that this process is for you as much as me to find out where we can help in case we don't know of something that's really important to you to help yeah. solve your problems. Yeah, I, there's a, there's a, another way I've handled this. I'm in the middle of a deal right now that is multi-stakeholder. I mean, mm-hmm. the first call with them had 12 people on it. I Like that's how big, like from a stakeholder perspective. And I was able to really quickly identify and say, at the very beginning, I kind of laid out the expectations, right? In the initial discovery. And I laid out the agenda, like we're going to, this is, we're going to, there's a lot of you. So I want to, I want to hear from each of you. So this is going to take a little while to get through. And based on the size of how many people are involved, because they had a committee, Mm -hmm. like, let's gather all that information. And then I think this is going to actually take us several calls, Mm. which I personally (laughs) don't like, but I knew like, I wasn't going to get everything I needed in the first call because there were so many people. I knew this was a complex sale Mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons because there's so many people involved, not just in decision making, but the number of people we would be training was large, still going on. And so I laid it out for them up front and said, this is going to take several calls. Mm -hmm. And then like even towards the end of the discovery, Right. I said, you know, when I started getting into the understanding their buyer process, like, let's talk about what this process looks like on your end. Mm -hmm. So how does this normally work? Who would ultimately make this decision? But more importantly, when do you guys, when did you anticipate getting started? Mm. Right. And, And like, when were you hoping to have training start? Right. And they gave me a specific like, well, we were looking at September. I'm like, okay, well, let me just kind of paint the picture for you. For us to start in September with this many people, with a variety of content, not just one subject, we would need to be working together as a group, laying out your content in July. So this was like, I want to say this was early May, maybe. Mm -hmm. So there was, I'm like, we need to like actually start laying content out in July in two months in order to make your September deadline. So let's reverse engineer it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I painted the picture of what the expectations were, how many calls it would take to get everybody on the same page. I gave them homework, so to speak, a micro commitment of things that they needed to do in preparation for the next call and let them know that we still haven't given them a price yet because it's that big and complex of the deal. You can lay out the expectation you can do the things that that you've already said, right? Like, uh, I'd love to get to the price. I need a little more information before I can actually give you the best price. We might not even be a good fit for you. Yeah. And until I get more information, I, I'm I'm not I'm not trying to play a game with you based on what we sell, right? Yeah. Um, it's not like here's one price and we're not a commodity with you know take it off the shelf. It's not trans. Not overly transactional. It's very no. much and. 
maybe they're not a good fit for you, right? If, if you're going to just want to get to the price straight away, maybe we're not the right fit for you because the last thing we want to do is to sell you something that isn't going to tick all your boxes. And in order yeah. to tick, it's, it's just one of those things. And I think, like you said, framing it from the beginning, educating them that this is the process and this is how it works. And if any, if I was a buyer and you said that to me, I'd be like, well, I'm going with Gina because she really wants to take the time to care to understand me and what my needs are. Um, it, it's, 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 I love that you say that because this client in particular that I'm talking about, um, prospect that um, I just did their second discovery call the other day. And there were less stakeholders on that call, which mm-hmm. I was like, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and um, by the end of that call, you know, I said, okay, we're getting closer to what we, what we need. And um, we have our next steps for that. You know, we're getting to the pricing part. We're not there yet. But towards the end of that call, one of them said, you know, thank you so much for all the time you've put in to this with us. And everything that they, that they were saying throughout that call implied that we were vendor of choice, right? We don't have a deal on the table yet. Um, they haven't signed off on anything yet, but we know, and this is something that we teach at Sales Gravy, how do you tell if if you're getting an implicit yes? And everything is aiming towards implicit yes. And I had someone else on that call from Sales Gravy on with me. And I'm like, what did you think? And she's like, the way they're talking, it's as if they're going with us now. On our first call, they said that there were six vendors in play. And I think that's where maybe I got earned some respect with I kind of just laid it, laid it out for them. I'm like, well, if you got six vendors involved, this, this could take a while, you know, what's really important to you from a vendor perspective. And then I even asked them who they were looking at. And one Mm -hmm. of the guys said, why would you ask that question? I'm just, I'm just curious. Like that was, that would be a question we would want our guys to ask, but why are you asking that? I'm like, so I want to know. I, that will give me an indication of who you think is good, what's important to you. I'm like, that That tells me a lot by who mm. you're looking at. Um, but but now the, the whole conversation, um, it's like we've spent this much time together. They're pretty invested in us as we are in them. I love that you asked that question. You said, who else? Just so I can get an idea. Um, and I think I was thinking about this while you were saying it. I think... In recruitment as well, when I sense that somebody, if I'm not feeling confident in that moment, I might not ask the right questions. And I think a lot of people do this. So for example, I I was rushing um, a process with a candidate and I sensed they were so good. I was like, I'm going to get them into that placement straight away. I know because I've got to be quick. Someone else is going to snap this candidate up otherwise. And I missed asking them that question because I was actually scared of the answer. And I think there are a lot of people like this in sales. I do. I think what it means, and this is what desperation looks like when you're at the bottom of that roller coaster. you don't ask the important questions. And in my case, it wasn't that I was desperate. It was that I was in a rush because I had a load of different things to do. But I think some people do get desperate. And because they're so desperate, they don't want to admit or find out that blind spot, which could teach them the reality that they're not going to close the deal. It's, it's interesting. It's denial. It's denial. That's what it is. Yeah, it's, it's, um, again, I go back to the kid thing, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I have often been called a big kid and mm-hmm. I take that as a compliment. There's because I'm genuinely curious. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'm unfiltered. I mm-hmm. ask what's on my mind, but I'm genuinely curious because uh, I, I want to know what's on the playing field. Like, why wouldn't I ask those questions? Why mm. wouldn't I ask you? Now, I never ask budget question because I truly believe people find the money for the things that they need and they want. So I never ask budget because uh, that's a whole nother story. Every time someone tells me how flush they are with cash is usually when they can't pay the bill. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. that's another story. So I, I, that's a question I don't ask, but I do ask things like, who else are you talking to? Um, Why are you looking at them? What is it about them? I've closed deals because of that, because I was able to set myself up for success. Mm. I did this with another deal that is now an ongoing client that when they told me the competitors and I asked them why, and they told me why, it actually helped me strengthen my proposal by setting my proposal up with a more specific solution. And for us, that would be 
here's the training solution and here's the trainer that I'm going to assign to you because they are so strong in this vertical that is your space. And that's why they were looking at the competitor because the competitor was very experienced in that vertical. Mm. So I knew that 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 would give us a leg up if they were going to go with the other one because they, you know, people get hooked people get attached to that concept of like, well, they have experience in the vertical and I have to turn that around all the time and say, do you want experience in the vertical or do you want experience in closing deals? Mm -hmm. So you, so to me, you have to, you have to ask those questions and why, why would you be afraid to ask that question? That's what, that's what I don't understand. Yeah. Well, I'm, I agree with you because I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not afraid of people. And I remember when I was very young, someone said to me when I was um, just in a shop closing account cards, it was very like, it was a student job. They were like, you're not scared of people, are you? And I was like, no, because what's the worst that can happen, right? You're not scared of people. In fact, I'm probably a bit more scared of people than you are, Genus from Marco. <laughs> Cause I've sat in your discovery calls and I actually believe one of, I'm, you know, I'm, you could argue I'm quite English, you could argue whatever, but I am more used to implying things because mm-hmm. again, we've been through this in our, um, in our culture episode, but it's very, it's thought of to be more American to get straight to the point. But since I've been hanging out with you Americans, I've been <laughs> practicing, I've been practicing being a bit more direct. And you know what? I've surprised myself. It works. If you're not afraid to, then go for it ask those direct questions um and yeah hey, well, look at her she's looking all proud there looking all <laughs> well, proud. I'm, I'm i'm sorry i'm thinking about one of the questions that i ask that you now have been using more and it just makes Go me on. smile you know what Go question <laughs> <laughs> what are you afraid of <laughs> <laughs> that's it what are I you even say of? it in an American accent, but yeah. it's true. You know, there are some brilliant open questions out there for discovery that, and I just put what in front of so in front of everything. I mean, it's, you know, it's old school open questions, but with anyone, with, if ever you want to get information out of someone, what else, what are you afraid of? What's on your mind when you said that? Why is that important to you? Can you tell me a bit more about what it is about that that is important to you? There's, oh, there's some golden questions and I beg everyone to write down your discovery questions because I've got my questions written down. But how many times are you in a discovery call and you forget those awesome golden questions? So I, I would say mm. to everyone who's listening to this, if you're doing sales, have your golden questions up so you don't forget them because that will get you the information that you need. Well, I mean, there's, there's, okay, so here's my philosophy in general. I know you probably have more questions on your list from listeners, but my my philosophy on discovery is that, and we teach this at Sales Gravy, there's a framework, it's a score framework. Uh, so we we teach that, which is categories of questions. And there's, there are questions that you have to get answered at some point, right? Um, about their buying process, about, uh, about where they are now, where they want to go. Like there are questions that you have to ask really good questions, right? Have that list. And then be ready to pivot and improvise on that list so that there's some fluidity in the discovery because it should be a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a discovery conversation. So you have to be able to flow with it and not process them. And Mm -hmm. I think, and and I'm sure you're okay with me saying this. I think this was some feedback I gave to you months ago of slow down Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. the questions and Ask a question based on the last answer you got. Well, this is what you train, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is my style and and this is based on, I don't know if I necessarily train on it. It sounds like I have to create a micro course on this. <laughs> I've, um, heard, I've heard your course. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I, I've never I've never actually trained on a specific discovery conversation course, but coming from improv, we always we're so active listening that the next question, and, and I've had this, you know, through being a podcast host as well. A, a lot of my questions are based on the last answer you gave me. Mm. So I'm digging deeper. I'm saying, tell me more about that last thing you just told me. And so what that does for for the person I'm talking to is it makes them feel like I'm really listening because I'm drilling down. I'm like, oh, tell me more about that. Mm. 
And then all I got to do is say, tell me more about that. And actually there's a, we call it color advance and improv. I've changed the name at sales gravy for that, but it's like color, color. Give me details is what color means. Give me details, color it. And then advance is like, okay, move forward, right? Keep, Mm -hmm. keep going on with what you were saying. So I am trying to have a conversation that feels like it's not an interrogation. Mm, mm. Eventually I have to get all the important questions asked. Yeah. But I have to know when to weave those in. So it's about timing and I don't have to be, you know, this is something Jeb talks about when it comes to training. Our training doesn't have to be linear, meaning we don't have to follow PowerPoint slide by PowerPoint slide by PowerPoint slide. So oftentimes when I do um, a breakout and I'm having them work on challenges, we might come back into the group and they start talking about challenges. I might actually fast forward 15 slides and be like, you know, because you guys brought that up, I want to address that now. Mm -hmm. Right. And so Mm -hmm. I fast forward. Sometimes the salespeople, we get so linear Mm -hmm. that you can feel it. It's a, it feels transactional. Like, and now for the next question. And do you think that comes from confidence? Which, which part? That people become very linear. So I'm, you know, as salespeople, some salespeople say, don't give me a script, right? Mm -hmm. And some salespeople say, please give me a script. But the minute they go off script onto a framework, which is what we do um, and what you were just talking about, when they go off that and they bring, it's like if you were doing a speech and you wrote everything you wanted to say down, but the minute you put it down and just memorized it, you do a better job because you're doing it as Gina, not as in the linear what you wrote. Oh, you, you just described how Gina does do a speech. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, many of my keynotes in the past, I mean, they're a little more um, linear and structured at sales gravy, but oftentimes, um, especially for keynote addresses, I would like, if a client gave me a topic, we want you to talk about this. Now, I often, before I was at sales grade, we did a lot of keynote speaking and they would hire me because they're like, we want an engaging speaker. And they would just dictate the topic to me. Can Mm -hmm. you talk about X, Y, Z? Right. And it might not have been a talk that I already had. So then I would have to create the talk. And so I would create the talk. I would write it out. I'd practice it. Um, I'd even structure it with some PowerPoint. But then I would improvise because Mm -hmm. I was doing it based on the audience reaction. Mm -hmm. So I've had that. I I did a keynote a year and a half ago where um, it was a client that had booked me before the pandemic hit and it kept getting moved, kept getting it. So it was like two years later and I was already at sales gravy, but I, I kept my commitment to give it. But by the time it was time to give it, everything had changed in the world. And I was actually, I showed up and changed everything I was going to talk about on the spot. And I told the audience that I said, I'm not going to give the talk I originally planned on giving. Here's what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to completely improvise this. It was the best talk I ever gave. I had a line of people waiting to talk to me. I'm like, I <laughs> I think I found a new way to give a talk. Um, you got to read. How did you the- get over the fear? How did you get over the fear of getting not having a script, not having a plan, and going into that improv? How did you trust yourself? Because I was, I'm an expert in the subjects I was talking about. Yeah. Right. So what they what they really wanted was they wanted a motivational talk for this was for. Um, here we in, in the States, we call it, um, uh, it's like administrative professionals day. So <laughs> it, it was a talk to like 350 administrative professionals mm-hmm. and they wanted it to be motivational because they were burnt out from everything that they had been going through because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I decided at the last minute I had one subject planned And I don't even remember what that was, but at the last minute I said, you know what, I'm going to give them my yes and talk, which is a talk that um, I have pretty memorized because I've given it so much. And it's about finding, finding the positive and negative situations. And it's all based on yes and. So that was the talk I gave. And I talked about the things that had pulled me down in 2020 that were kind of tragic. Um, People had it worse than me. And I, and I said that too, but I just put out, I, I made myself very vulnerable to the mm. room. 
And I think that's where the confidence came from because I'm like, I went through that kind of horrible thing in life. I like many horrible things at one time and I came through it and that was the motivation for them. Mm. And that's where like, like people were crying and uh, coming up like, oh my gosh, that happened to me too. And this hat, like I went through that and I'm so happy. I'm not alone hearing it. So part of that is, is being open and vulnerable, showing yourself. Yes. You're very good at that. You're, you're good at disclosing your vulnerabilities, but you do it in a very confident way. Um, as we know from the episode about Gina, <laughs> where, we got, where we got deep, deep into Gina's vulnerabilities. I forgot, vulnerabilities. About, I forgot yeah, about that. That was episode. a good episode. But yeah, um, have I got time for another question? Yeah. So this question actually came today. Um, Ooh. And I've never actually come across this. So okay. I'm keen to know if you have. How can I make my client feel at ease on a discovery call? Because I feel that sometimes that they are very inhibited. And I I imagine what this, what this lady meant when she asked this question was in the virtual world, because what she was describing was through virtual meetings on Zoom. Um, and this, this, this is a challenge that many people have. I am keen to answer, but you, you're going to go first. I can see you're 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 <laughs> you're ready to answer. How how to make them comfortable on a call? Yeah. So how to make them feel comfortable on a discovery call? And the scenario I I probably would give for this is because I know this person and I know what kind of sales they do. It's when they're when you're meeting someone for the first time, a completely cold discovery call. Yeah. Um, now you and me, we're confident people. We sell to salespeople mostly. We sell yeah. to sales business people. Now this person doesn't sell to business people. They sell to people in the medical world, managers who maybe aren't as comfortable in yeah. in person as as you and I are. Uh, well, some of the things that I would do in that scenario is preparation is everything. So if I'm going into a call with someone I don't know, mm-hmm. I try to do some homework to try to find something about them. Now you might mm-hmm. not always be able, especially like if they're in the, from how you describe it, I'm the first thing that came to my mind is like a practice manager. So maybe it's a practice manager and are they on LinkedIn? Usually they're not. Um, I would start there and try to like look them up and, and usually a practice manager. And again, I'm just guessing um, I might then go to like a Facebook because usually they're on Facebook Mm -hmm. and I might find them there and try to just like kind of research them a little bit. And if I can't find anything out about them personally to connect, when I get on that call, I am trying to analyze really quickly. And this is so funny because part of you, like the first thing that came to my mind is selling with humor. So Mm -hmm. I always go to a place of how can I lighten it up? And Mm -hmm. usually I can lighten it up with humor. How do I do that? I'm as quickly as possible trying to assess the situation for something I call, you know, what is the first funny or interesting thing in the scenario that that person might react to? So I might test the water with something that will make them smile or engage them. That's about them. Or I might start with like, hey, Susanna, I know you got to be so busy in that office right now with everything going on. Right. So I might go, oh, yeah. so I busy. might, I might go straight to something that, you know, if I can't, if I don't know something about you personally, I'm going to try to understand your job. Yeah. yeah. So that I can find a way to connect with you and be like, I know you got to be so busy with what you're doing. And I cannot tell you enough how much I appreciate having I'll just a little bit of time with you today. And I hope it's a nice break from your day. Yeah. So I, I'm trying to make it about them, basically. Yeah. And I think that's good. I think, I think that's, that, that's great. I think, um, may, yeah, finding out about their day, finding out a bit about them, showing that you're, you're empathetic to their day, what they're doing. And yes, and I'm practicing <laughs> Gina's skills. Um, I think, also relaxing yourself. Um, and oh, I, yeah, good one. 
I think a lot of people, they come into these situations, if you're nervous and you're feeling tense or as um, our friend Anthony Ian Marino says, if you're, <laughs> if you're feeling inferior, then you will come across inferior when, and yeah. that will make them feel nervous. And sometimes yeah. it is just having a message or something that makes you feel good about yourself, maybe behind your screen or something that just makes you think, my my goal today is to make this other person feel good, not to make myself feel better. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I, this has come up before. This is not something new, but a compliment, mm-hmm. but a genuine compliment. Don't compliment just a compliment because people can read through that, but a genuine compliment. Like I was in a discovery call last week with, and I went and I looked her up and I found her on LinkedIn and um, checked her out and she, beautiful woman with this amazing hair. And then when we got on the call and she's on Zoom, I'm like, I'm just going to tell you, I love your hair. And that, that's literally now that's risky because I barely know her, but it was a way for me to figure her out really quickly. Either she's going to be like, whoa, what? And have like a negative reaction or negative, negative. Right. Or she might, right. Because she might be thrown off by like, what? Yeah. Right. She might not take it the right way. She might like, like, what? This is a business call. And I'm like, I love your hair. I just checked you out on LinkedIn and I was like, oh my gosh, I love your hair. And so it made her smile. She started laughing. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in the South right now. Look at this. Like, I am like so frizzed out right now. And I start, she's like, girl, I know I'm originally from Mississippi. Like, and then it just broke into this, like where she was from in the South. And like, we just went into this. Like we were two girlfriends having wine conversation. And I was like, yes. Like I broke the ice in five seconds. Yes. So you probably even got there before the, what Jeb says in sales EQ, the dopamine goes in your brain when you ask people questions and they get to disclose things about themselves. It's like, they feel like they're having good food and all these types of things. Um, You got there before that point so you had a head start by doing that but yeah, you, you five, pitched like, it right you pitched it in the right way in like five seconds yeah and this is before everybody else got to the call so it's just me and her and there were supposed to be two other people yeah the two other people had already met and then the two of us were brought on for both sides and so we're like oh you're here I'm here we're the other <laughs> two right and so I had to find a way to like make her comfortable because she was new to the to the sh- to the party and I was new to the party and the party yeah. hosts weren't there yet. Yeah, yeah. And it's being genuine with it, isn't it? You know, Gina, mm-hmm. I Gina, I love your hair. It's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> I, do, I do, I do, I do. I love your hair. I love oh, your hair. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's such good nuggets there. Such good nuggets there. And I know that I really do think that without sucking up, I do think you are queen of discovery because I have witnessed your discovery calls. And oh, I, I think you've got it down to a T. So. Uh-oh. So. Uh-oh. Am I right in thinking that we've got through enough discovery questions for today? Listen to questions for today. Yes, I think. I think so. I hope we get more though, because I love talking about discovery. Yeah, we have got more. In fact, we've got a whole load of questions still to Sweet. go. So you can keep us busy, keep us in business. Okay, but, good. Um, so the new thing, would you rather, is last season. We have a new season here <laughs> for the mother your women. We really don't have a new season, but okay. Well, the women, your mother warned you about. <laughs> um, so the, well, the new season of questions at the okay. end. Oh, is, gosh. It's a choice. You get to choose. Oh, okay. So you can either reveal something to the listeners and I Ooh. choose. I get to choose what you reveal. Or you can do a test question. So it's reveal or test. What is wait, wait, what does test mean? Test is like quiz, mini quiz. Oh, okay. Like one okay. question. One question quiz. Okay. But I okay. Like, it's like it's like truth or dare. It is, but a bit more business like. <laughs> gosh, okay. So what's it going to be? Reveal, oh. reveal, or oh, quiz? Oh, gosh. Oh, what do I want to do? I'm going to reveal. Ooh, of course you are. So. I'm so scared. <laughs> I thought it'd be nice. It's the first one we will get. We will, okay. get, we will get deeper. But Gina Jamartha, what has been the most cringeworthy moment in Discovery Call? That's happened to you 
you, you've impressed us now. We want to know about the cringe, oh. embarrassing, like, oh my gosh, that was like, you couldn't write it. Yeah, I, I had one of those recently <laughs> and it was, it was definitely a cringe. I think it was so cringe. I've tried to put it out of my mind and don't remember the exact details, but it was definitely, don't tell Jeb. <laughs> um, haha, he listens. It, it was a discovery call that I got on and I just, I didn't do it right. And I didn't do enough homework on it. I think number one, um, I didn't do enough prep on it to prepare for it. And I didn't fully understand. It wasn't so much. I didn't understand the industry. I didn't understand what they wanted. And I had a really hard time pulling that out of the prospect. Like I was, I mean, at one point I even said, I'm, I'm sorry. I I'm, I'm really struggling to understand what you're asking us for. And he got kind of frustrated with me and um, he's like, you know, we might just not even be the right fit. And, um, and I followed up with, with the information that he asked for. And then of course he went cold and, and ghosted there, there going forward. So I know I screwed it up, but it was one of those, you know, you ask yourself like, what could I have done better? And the only thing that I could come up with was he was the last call of the day, which was at 6 p.m. my time. I had been at it since it was like a really long day. And I think I even apologized to him and said, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't think I'm operating fully as clear as I could be because it was like, a, it was like a, it really was like a 12 hour day because I think yeah, I yeah. had a seven, I think I had a 7 a.m. call internationally. And by the time 6 p.m. came around, I wasn't firing on, you know, all engines. He couldn't get on a Zoom. I was trying to squeeze him in my schedule. I squeezed him in at 6 p.m. at night, couldn't see him. And I could definitely feel the impact of, I love being on Zoom calls for calls and I couldn't see him to read him and all those things, um, which really shows you the power of, of being on video. But I cringed at, I didn't, I couldn't seem to understand him. And at the end of the day, I don't know if it was the right fit because he wasn't really great at articulating he wanted sales manager training, but they didn't have any sales managers. And I couldn't quite understand what he was asking me for. So that would be my most cringeworthy that I felt like I sucked. I think discovery. that's a bit tame, actually. Um, um, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> because that does happen, right? Sometimes you just have a different, lang la you have a different language. That's <laughs> to me. No, that was that. I felt really, I just felt like I sucked at it. And um, not that embarrassing, though, right? Not, not embarrassing. Because I've, I've, got, I've got an embarrassing one. I mean, if Jeb had been on it, I would have been embarrassed. Just do wanna, saying. Do you want to hear? Okay, let me hear yours. Yeah, let me um, hear yours. So... This was my early 20s and the days where I was just going off on visits and I went to a really posh school in Knightsbridge to sell to the head teacher, right? Because I used to sell to schools, I used to do education recruitment. And I got dressed really quickly that day, took my stuff out of the <laughs> out of the tumble dryer, put my tights on. And then suddenly I was wearing a really nice dress. And then suddenly when I was walking up the stairs, I noticed something was like dragging along no. attach, attached to no. my tights. no, no. <laughs> No, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say. It's not as bad as you think. It wasn't like my bra, it wasn't my pants, but it was like, it was like, you know, those old pull-up tights that you used to have, like stockings, um, I think we call them, but they were really thin ones and somehow they'd like stayed attached to like my tights, like because of the static. And like, I was like walking around with tights, just dragging along from my feet. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. And I only noticed at the end somehow. So I... <laughs> I mean, how cringe is that? And it was like the oh. poshest school, you know, where all the girls only wear their skirts below their knees and, you know. Oh, my yeah. God. So, yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that was a bit cringe. That was cringe. Kind of, that's kind of cringe. I like, I um, like the word cringe. Um, I also like, did you say tumbler chaya? <laughs> is that, did you say, did you say tumble dryer? Tumble dryer. Oh, tumble. What do, you call it? what do you call it? Tumble dryer. What do you, is it, what do you call it? The thing that you dry your clothes with? <laughs> dryer. Oh, okay. You don't call it tumble dryer. I don't call it tumble dryer. No, <laughs> no, I don't. And oh, so we I have all... to go get the clothes out of the tumble dryer. Yeah, that's what we do, no? 
I love it when we come across a, a, a nugget of an English versus American word. When we, don't, we don't even try. We just improv it. It came out. Oh, okay, we well, as a matter of fact, I have to go now get stuff out of the tumble dryer. So <laughs> I think Be it's sure time. to miss your stockings. <laughs> I'll make sure to take off my stockings from my <laughs> pants. Don't let oh. your stockings stick to your pants. I hope our listeners find this as funny as we find ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, as always, it has been delightful and lush to be here with you, yeah. Susanna Gray Jones. It's been totally awesome. Thank you. <laughs> 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 All right, listeners, we got to go. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Women Your Mother Warns You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy. Hey, go check out our courses at salesgravy.university. You will find all kinds of courses there uh, by myself and Susanna, and of course, Jeb and many others. Go check that out to level yourself up. And for more information about the show, go to womenyourmotherwarnsyoubout.com. You can also find Susanna and I at salesgravy.com. I'm out of here. Good night, Susanna Gray-Jones. Good evening. Good afternoon to Gina. Thanks for a lovely podcast. Bye.